Thank you so much for being here. I'm Laura Blyle, uh, the Director of External Engagement here at the Research Park, and it's my honor today to introduce Adil Akhtar, who's the CEO and founder of Psionic. But that's a really fancy title, but I remember working with Adil when this was an idea, and this was, he was a student, and he um, had a vision for really making a difference, but also doing something that was truly disruptive. And uh, I think that he has forged a path that is one um, that many of us want to emulate and learn from. And that's why we invited him here today. Uh, if you are not familiar with the story, it's been documented in many places, including a, it's my favorite, which is seeing it on the Big Ten Network. Um, as well as other places, um, because I think it's a story and a concept that many people um, can really want to engage with and want to understand and want to um, support uh, this effort and this work that is so um, mission driven, but also has a lot of really cool tech. Um, probably one of my favorite things to do is to bring people to visit a deal in the enterprise in his enterprise work office suite and have him show off uh, this technology. So I'm guessing that might be part of the presentation today. It doesn't always Maybe. have the same effect on Zoom, but, um, but promising that someday when we get back to a little bit of normalcy, we'll be able to do some more show and tell. So um, with that, I do want to also brag that uh, Deal is a proud uh, alum of the University of Illinois and transitioned uh, from uh, his PhD program into being an, a full-fledged entrepreneur. So uh, with fur without further ado, it's really, I uh, want to introduce to all of you Adil Akhtar and hear the story of Psionic. So thank you so much. Thanks, Laura, for the kind introduction. And um, so as she mentioned, I'm Adil Akhtar. I'm the CEO and founder of a company in Enterprise Works called Psionic. And what we do is we uh, build and develop advanced bionic limbs that are affordable and accessible for people uh, with uh, amputations. And so when I give these talks, I usually like to start off with a commercial that the University of Illinois made um, that kind of like highlights the journey of being like a young kid and going all the way to some uh, like amazing things that you can do um, here at the university. How did they do that? What did you do? Where's the English building? Could you go over that again? Hey, can I check that? What is that paper do? Can I tell you my idea? How can we make it cheaper? Do you think this will work? How did that fail? And if you didn't notice, that was me at the end of that video. Um, and also Sergeant Garrett Anderson, who's on this call, um, as well as he as he gazed into my eyes. And uh, one of the things that I really like uh, about that commercial in particular, as I was mentioning, was that, you know, it starts off with, you know, these kids who are curious about the world. And it's going all the way to like, you know, where we uh, get this, where I got my PhD and we're doing these muscle powered, mind controlled bionic limbs. And for me personally, the journey started when I was actually seven years old and I was, uh, I was born in the U S but my parents are from Pakistan and I was visiting Pakistan. And that's actually the first time that I had met uh, someone with a limb difference. And she was my age seven uh, missing her right leg and living in poverty on the streets. And she was using a broken tree branch as a crutch. And that's what inspired me to want to go into this field. And so uh, I went to uh, Loyola university of Chicago for my undergrad and uh, like, most um, South Asian kids that go to Loyola University of Chicago is pre-med. And uh, it wasn't until my sophomore year of undergrad that I took my first computer science class and I absolutely loved it. I loved coding, programming, like, you know, putting um, uh, like engineering and putting things together and making things. And I realized that if I just became a straight up MD, I wouldn't get to do all the cool stuff that I was learning in my CS classes. I wanted to kind of figure out a way of how I could combine my interests in engineering and, and computer science with um, prosthetics and, and um, clinical neuroscience as well. And it was around 2000, 2000, uh, 2007, 2008, that there was a huge breakthrough at an institution right across the street um, in downtown Chicago, um, which is called the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. It used to be known as the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And um, 
They're the number one rehabilitation hospital in the US for the last 30 years. And they had just made a huge breakthrough in mind control bionic limbs. And so this video is showing um, Amanda Kitts. And so she lost her left arm right above her elbow due to a motorcycle accident, I believe. And she's controlling this arm just by using her residual muscles and thinking about the action that she wants to perform. So when she wants to bend her phantom elbow, the elbow on this bionic uh, um, limb moves. When she rotates her wrist, when she makes a pinch, um, she can even um, move these blocks from this table. Um, and this was exactly what I wanted to do, right? This is, um, I mean, this was the perfect combination of, uh, like I said, clinical neuroscience, physical medicine, rehabilitation, computer engineering, electrical engineering. But there's just one huge problem. And that is that the arm that she's wearing um, costs around like $100,000 to make. And the thing is, is that there are over 10 million people with hand amputations across the entire world. And 80% of them are in developing nations and less than 3% have access to affordable prosthetic care. And so on this, um, on this picture on the left, on this guy's right side, you see um, what is the most prevalent um, prosthetic device in the world, uh, which is a hook. And so basically it's two steel pincers connected with a bicycle cable that goes to your shoulders. Then when you squeeze your shoulders together, this, uh, the, the hook will open. And when you relax your shoulders, um, this hook will close. And I mean, this is technology that hasn't changed since like the Civil War era in the United States. It looks like a hook. All it can do is open and close. Uh, and so we want to bring this technology to the 21st century, right? And so what you see on this guy's left hand is what's known as a myoelectric prosthesis. So myo meaning muscle and electric meaning, well, electric, right? And the way that that um, hand works is that um, there are muscle sensors that are located on his forearm. When he tries to close his hand, the hand will respond accordingly. And when he tries to open his hand, um, then the hand will respond. And so um, that's a little bit more intuitive um, to control because you're still trying to do a hand open and close. But that hand in particular, it's super heavy, it's super slow, and all you can do is open and close it. Then the next step up from that is uh, what we call a multi-articulated hand, which gives you individual finger movements, but those hands are super fragile, they break down all the time, and um, they're also super slow. Finally, if you were fitted with one of these hands, um, you wouldn't actually be able to feel anything um, from it at all. And so those are all things that we've been working at Psionic to, um, uh, to, to help solve. And so we're gonna touch on each one of these uh, points. So we have um, advanced muscle control um, algorithms that allow you to do more than just uh, uh, hand open and close. You can do um, different grips, like making a pinch, making a fist, making a, a key grip, um, rocking on, etc. cetera. Um, we also make the hand um, super resilient to impacts, but we do it uh, with affordable materials so that we can actually hit a price point um, that insurances will cover. And finally, we are the first hand on the market to give users sensory feedback. And we'll be talking about all of these things um, over the next half hour. So to start with, how do we actually control this thing? Um, and so when you think about bending your elbow or, or making a fist, uh, uh, nerve signals, electrical signals are coming from your brain down your spinal cord all the way to your arm. And when your arm is trying to make that movement, it's amplifying those electrical signals. And we, use, uh, we can pick up those electrical signals from your skin through something called electromyography or EMG. So you might not be familiar with EMG, but we are probably familiar with is EKG. So that's the thing that you see in like all the, the television shows where um, you, you know, like it, the person's in the ER and they put the heart monitor on him, the sensors over his heart. And you see that little monitor in the back go beep, beep, beep. And then if they die, they flatline and goes beep, right? So imagine those same sensors, but instead of placing them over your heart, you place them over your muscles. And then when you don't do any activity, you'll see it flatline like at the beginning of this graph here. And then when you flex your muscles, you'll see this huge burst of activity like you see towards the end of this plot. And so to illustrate that further in the next video, um, you'll see um, a bunch of like eight, eight electrodes around my forearm and you'll see the muscle patterns associated with me doing those different movements with my hand.
NetLab showing all eight channels. And if I squeeze, you can see all channels are active. If I flex, extend, a pinch, three finger grasp, and open, and close. And the important thing to recognize here, and you can kind of see that uh, on the screen there, is that when I was doing those different movements with my hand, you could see different patterns of muscle activity on the screen that were corresponding to like me making a pinch or flexing my wrist or making a fist, et cetera. And so um, bagging up, so I, I ended up getting um, a bachelor's in biology at Loyola, and then I got a master's in computer science there. I taught in their computer science department for a couple of years. Um, before joining the MD PhD program here at the University of Illinois back in uh, 2010. So uh, time is just flying. Um, and so uh, when I joined the MD PhD program, I ended up getting a PhD in neuroscience in 2016 and another master's in electrical and computer engineering. And technically I'm on a leave of absence from med school, but um, building bionic limbs is a lot more fun. So I don't think I'm going to go back. Um, but to make things even more interdisciplinary, when I, when I joined um, the university here, um, we didn't do prosthetics at all. And the closest thing was uh, a professor named uh, Tim Brettel, who was in the aerospace engineering department, who was doing brain machine interfaces. And so it, to make it inter interdisciplinary enough, right, we just threw aerospace engineering in there as well, right? And so we didn't have prosthetics at the time, but because we were an aerospace engineering lab, what we did have were drones. And so one of my first projects was to control the flight of a drone just by using my muscles, using this uh, pattern recognition technology that we were developing. Okay. Right. And so when I rotated my wrist, the drone took off. When I point them to the right, it rotates clockwise. When I squeeze my fists together, it'll fly forward. When I point them to the left, it'll rotate counterclockwise. And then when I rotate my wrists again, it'll land. And that was just a really fun demonstration of what we could do with this muscle, muscle pattern recognition technology that we were developing. Now, I mean, that was, a, that was like a fun novelty application, but that's not why I got into grad school, right? I, I wanted to build prosthetic limbs um, for those who didn't have them. And the thing is at the time we had, um, we had established a collaboration with the, um, uh, with the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago or the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. And I mean, they're still two and a half hours north. They had all the expensive prosthetic limbs, but you know, if we got a chance to use it, then, then it might be for like half an hour a week. And, and, and more so if we ended up breaking it, then it'd be a huge problem because, you know, they're like really expensive. And so we were like, we're at the University of Illinois. We're one, of the, we're one of the best engineering schools in the entire world. Why don't we build our own prosthetic devices? And so it was around 2013, 2014 that there was a huge boom in consumer 3D printing. And um, now like every high school and grade school has a 3D printer and every, uh, everyone I talk to, uh, all the students, they all know what 3D printing is. But back in 2013, it was brand new technology, right? And so we got uh, a MakerBot Replicator 2X at the time in the lab. And over the last six years, we've actually gone through um, yeah, eight prototypes and we're um, heading toward our, our ninth and final one that'll be ready for our nationwide launch uh, later this year. And um, you can see that with each one of the, the very first one that we built, like on the top left, right, um, and each successive uh, prototype afterwards, the hand got smaller, more human looking, and much more um, feature rich uh, as well. And it's gone through a lot, a lot of iterations to get to the point um, where it's at um, right now. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those first two hands that you see on the top left and, and kind of um, what we learned in the process uh, of starting to, to make a business out of um, building these prosthetic devices. And so it was the um, spring of 2014 that we met this guy. And so this is David Krupa. He is the CEO and co-founder of a nonprofit organization called the Range of Motion Project or ROM. And they are based out of the United States, Guatemala and Ecuador. And their whole mission is to provide prosthetics 
to those who can't afford them um, around the world. And he's actually an alum of the University of Illinois as well. And so he was coming back to campus because he had won a, an award from the International Studies Program. And he was giving talks on his work with the Range of Motion Project. And I was just like, I have to talk to this guy, right? Because this is exactly what I want to do. So I uh, approached him after his talk and I was like, hey, we're 3D printing some hands like in our lab. Is this something that you might be interested in? And we were like, uh, and he was like, uh, yeah, maybe. And so the next day I showed him around the lab and, um, and then I didn't hear back from him again. And there was a kind of sad, um, but two weeks later, out of nowhere, I get an email from him that literally said, dude, I felt this vibe between us when we met and we've got to figure out a way to work together. And that's when Dave's and my bromance began. And then two weeks after that, um, he, uh, sent us another email saying that he was able to secure funding from the U.S. Embassy in Quito to have me and another graduate student uh, who was working with me go down to Ecuador for two weeks and try out one of our the prosthetic hands on, on a patient there. And it, keep in mind that we were at this like this first hand that does not work as a prosthetic hand really at all. Um, we barely got this thing to like like work with my muscles. And now we had to make something that was actually going to uh, work with a patient in Ecuador uh, of all places. And so um, it was a crazy summer trying to get that hand um, ready for this trip down to Ecuador. And so fast forward to the day before we fly down to Ecuador and we had nothing working, but we figured we have all the pieces to make sure that everything works. So when we fly down to Ecuador, um, we'll, we'll have like a couple of weeks to get everything working. And then when we do this on a patient, it'll be, uh, it'll be good and, and no problems at all. We fly down the, uh, to Quito. Dave picks us up from the airport. And the first thing he tells us is we've got a meeting with the U.S. Embassy tomorrow and they want to see everything working. And we were just like, oh my goodness. And it was basically the beginning of two weeks of all all-nighters trying to get this hand to work. And so he drove us to our hotel room and we got to work immediately. And we got the hand to a point um, where if I hooked it up to my own muscles and if I flexed my wrist really, really, really hard, I could barely get the hand to close. And if I extended my wrist really, really hard, I could barely get this hand to open. And so this next video shows um, our attempt of me trying to grab a, uh, a Powerade bottle um, using uh, our system. Yeah. Okay, so maybe the this uh, Powerade bottle was a little too wide and we needed to switch to uh, something smaller, like a, a Coke bottle. Okay. Perhaps something was still wrong with the programming and we needed to sort of reprogram it a little bit again. And this time we we're successfully able to grab the bottle. Uh, and mind you, the way that this hand is supposed to work is I'm supposed to like easily make a pinch or a tripod grip or a key grip and the hand does all those same things. Um, but it was moving and we figured we've got to show the US Embassy something. So this is what we got to show them. And so we brought this like giant mess of electronics through like US Embassy security. And we were uh, in, in front of the, the US ambassador's team um, there. And we showed them this demo of me grabbing this bottle. And, you, you know, again, this wasn't how it was supposed to work. And I we were worried that they'd be underwhelmed. But they, once they saw it, they, their minds were blown because they'd never seen a robot in their lives before. So they didn't know how it was supposed to work. And they were like, oh my goodness. Okay, so next week, um, when you do this on a patient, we're thinking we're going to have um, two news crews and three newspapers come and cover the event. And we were just like, oh man. So now the bar is set really high and we've got to get this hand like working properly. And then they started asking us questions like, where are you guys from? And we said, we're from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. They said, you're from the University of Illinois. In that case, we're going to bump you up 
to all the international media stations because it turns out that at the time, the president of Ecuador was actually an alum of the University of Illinois. And any chance that he got to promote the university, he took. So if the bar wasn't set high now, now it was set super high. And the next day we met our patient. And so this um, is Juan Tsukio. He lost his left hand uh, 40 years uh, ago due to machine gun fire from a helicopter. He was in the Ecuadorian army and there was a border war between um, Ecuador and Peru. And um, this picture was us trying to um, get the hand working on him and it wasn't working at all, unfortunately. Um, to make matters worse, he actually had to fly out to Brazil the next day and he wouldn't be back until the day that the media was coming, which meant that we basically only had one chance to get this right in front of international news stations. And like I said, two weeks of all-nighters trying to figure out what's wrong with this hand. Okay, so fast forward to the following Thursday, uh, the day that the media is coming. The media was going to get there at 9 a.m. Um, and the previous night, um, Dave Krupa told uh, me and, and Mary, the other graduate student who's pictured here with me, that we uh, uh, that he's going to pick us up at 6 a.m. And whatever we have working at that point, we're just going to have to uh, roll with it. 6 a.m. rolls around. Mary and I have been up for about 32 hours straight trying to figure out what is wrong with this hand. I'm, uh, I, Mary's looking at this giant rat's nest of a breadboard trying to figure out what could be wrong there. And I am looking through hundreds of lines of code and seeing if there's anything uh, messed up there. And it was around 6.08 that I see this one line of code that just looks a little bit off. And so I send Dave a text message and I'm like, Dave, I think I might've found something. I just need a couple more minutes. And he's like, okay. And so it turns out there was one line of code where two variables were switched on the opposite side of an equal sign. And as soon as I switched those two variables, everything started working. When I made a pinch, the hand made a pinch. When I made a fist, the hand made a fist. And had Dave actually come to pick us up on time, we would not have figured it out. So we were actually lucky that he was late. But it's one thing for the hand to work on me. It's another thing for it to work on an actual patient with an amputation. So we figure that Juan's going to get there at 8 a.m., an hour before the media comes. We'll hook him up to all the sensors and we'll make sure that the hand is working. So that way the media comes, we can show them this demo. It'll be smooth sailing. 9 a.m. rolls around and all the media is there and Juan's not there yet. In fact, Juan doesn't get there until 10 a.m. So the media is already super annoyed. And again, we've only got one chance now in front of these international media stations to get this right. And so as soon as he gets there, the first thing we do is we hook up all the muscle sensors to his residual limb. And then we check to see if we can read those, uh, the muscle patterns, the same way you saw in that video earlier, where I was doing all those different movements with my hand and you could see my muscle patterns on the screen. So we did this and every single channel was dead. We weren't getting any muscle signals from him at all. And, and Mary and I were like, we just got this working on me. How is this possible? And so we, Mary and I, we go into debug mode. We're trying to find out what's wrong with this giant mess of a breadboard. And Juan and Dave are uh, trying to stall with the media, you know, telling the backstory of the range of motion project and how Juan lost his hand just to buy us enough time to get this, uh, get this hand working. And so uh, we checked the voltage on this breadboard and we noticed that the numbers were off. And usually what that's indicative of is a issue with your power supply. And so we were powering this giant mess of a breadboard with two nine volt batteries. And we noticed that one of the nine volt batteries um, was puffed up to about double in size and was burning hot to the touch. And had we not noticed it at that point, we might've been on the news for a different reason. But fortunately I had a fresh nine volt in my pocket and I swapped out the one that was uh, hooked up incorrectly and uh, we hooked it up correctly and all the signals started showing up and we were just thinking, okay, whew, crisis averted. But it's one thing for us to read his muscle signals. It's another thing for the pattern recognition algorithms to work and the, the, the robotic hand to respond accordingly. And so the way that this hand worked was that when you turn it on, um, it'll undergo a training procedure 
where we ask uh, where the hand will uh, make a pinch and make a fist. It'll do a hand open. It'll relax. Um, it'll do like a tripod grasp. And it'll uh, ask you to hold each one of those movements for about 15 seconds so it can recognize your muscle patterns associated with making those movements. And so the whole thing takes about two minutes um, to train. And so we turn the hand on and it starts to undergo the training procedure. And um, Juan holds a pinch for 15 seconds, a tripod grasp for 15 seconds, a fist, hand open, relax, and the hand opens back up and um, it should be ready for him to control. And I ask him to close his hand and nothing happens. And Mary and I are just like, what else could go wrong at this point? And then this is completely serendipitous as well. And so Juan, and we didn't know this uh, uh, until we had met, but Juan happens to be um, uh, Muslim and the leader of all the Muslims in Quito, Ecuador. And I happen to be Muslim myself uh, as well. And the thing is, Ecuador is a 99.9% .9 Catholic country. So the odds of me actually working not only with a Muslim there, but the leader um, uh, of all of them is, was just like next to nothing, right? And, and so we found this out after, after we had met. And so he, he looks at me and he's, he just says, Bismillah, say Bismillah. And so for those of you who don't know, Bismillah is, is just invoking the name of God and it's something that Muslims say before they do anything. And so I was just like, Bismillah, okay, Bismillah. So I hit the reset button on the hand and then the training procedure starts all over again. So he holds a pinch for 15 seconds. He holds a tripod grasp for 15 seconds, a fist hand open, relax, the hand opens up again. I ask him to close it. And this time the hand closes and the media comes rushing around the table asking Juan how it feels to be moving his hand. And I just take a step back, a huge sigh of relief. And I'm thinking of, in my head, you are a man of God. And so this next video shows one of those international news um, stations covering the events of that day. Quiteño es el primer beneficiado de una prótesis de mano con la ayuda en su financiamiento. El programa es realizado por jóvenes de la Universidad de Illinois en Estados Unidos. Juan Suquillo es ex comandante de guerra. Fue así como perdió parte de su brazo. De esto ha pasado más de 30 años. Varios miembros de mi pelotón eh, sufrieron heridas y la, particularmente la mía me cobró el brazo izquierdo. Gracias al avance de la tecnología, hoy puede acceder a una prótesis. Parte de mía ha vuelto. Ha vuelto. Jóvenes ingeniosos y con My hair was cooler then. El próximo más necesitado ha desarrollado una prótesis de brazo bioeléctrico con la posibilidad de retroalimentación sensorial, es decir, sentir como una mano de verdad. Okay, so a couple of things I want to point out, right? This hand that you see on the table, it's three times the size of a normal human hand. It's got wires going everywhere, plugged into breadboards, plugged into my laptop, plugged into um, two power supplies, plugged into the wall, right? Despite that, Juan said he felt as though a part of him had come back. He hadn't been able to make a pinch with his left hand in 35 years. In fact, he forgot how to do it and we had to retrain his brain in order to remember by putting a mirror in front of his amputated side, reflecting his intact right hand um, and then making a pinch uh, and then having to make a pinch with both hands at the same time um, while looking at the mirror, tricking his brain and thinking his left hand was there. And that reactivated those muscles. And for him to say that, a part of him had come back. That's when we realized that if I go the traditional route where I get my, I finish my MD PhD and I uh, hold like clinic once a week where I see patients and then do research for the rest of the week, this just ends up as a journal paper and or university project. And that's the end of it. If we want everyone to feel the same way that Juan did, the only way we could do that was to commercialize the technology. And that's when Psionic was born. So we came back to the university um, and it was in the fall of um, 2014 that we did i um, at Enterprise Works. Um, and then in 2015, we entered the COZAD New Venture Competition and we won that. Um, 2016, I won the Illinois Innovation Prize. Um, and then in 2017 through now, we've um, won 
um, several grants from the National Science Foundation raised uh, successfully raised an angel investor around um, as well. And the Ability Hand um, is now uh, available on the on the market. And so that's what the hand looked like then. And this is what it looks like now. And so this is um, Sergeant Garrett Anderson doing push-ups for one of the first times um, since his army days. Um, he's uh, holding a 50 pound kettlebell with ease and you're able to do activities of daily living. So one of our other patients was able to close his um, laptop uh, lid. Uh, one of our patients up in Chicago, um, she was able to feed her granddaughter for the first time by holding um, the her milk bottle with um, the ability hand. And another cool thing about it is that because it's actual carbon fiber on the hand, we can candy paint tint it different colors. So that's like a, a nice uh, red that we've got, a psionic red um, that we had on the hand for uh, Tina up in Chicago. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for uh, just a second. And can you guys see me all right? I, I'm, I'm hoping that's uh, a, a yes. All right, yeah, great, thanks, Laura. Um, and so I've got the uh, ability hand here with me um, as well. And so typically um, we've got muscle sensors that, that, uh, that we have in this that you can use to control the hand, um, but I don't have those hooked up to me, um, but it has Bluetooth on it. And so we've got an app for it. There's an app for everything these days. Um, and so it's both on Android and iOS. And so I, I got my Android phone right over here. And so uh, all five fingers flex and extend and the thumb rotates as well. Um, this is actually super fast. Um, it is the world's fastest bionic hand. Um, it closes within 200 milliseconds. And to put that in perspective, um, you blink your eyes in about 300 milliseconds. So it's actually faster than the blink of an eye. Um, and so you can do different grips with it. So here's like a, a key grip. Um, if you want to give someone a thumbs up, you can give them a thumbs up. Um, you can do uh, a, a pinch. Here's a, um, a tripod grasp over here. If you're at a rock concert, you know, you can um, rock on. Um, you can also do pointing with individual fingers. So here's pointing um, with your index finger. And yes, you can point with other fingers too. Um, you can point with your middle finger. Uh, it's something that patients always ask for. And yes, uh, you, you can do that. Uh, so other things about this, like I mentioned, this is actual carbon fiber. So it's actually super light, super strong. It weighs less than an average adult sized human hand. So this is 470 grams. The average adult human hand is about um, 500 grams. Um, it's the fingers are made out of um, rubber and silicone, so I can actually like hit these with a hammer. It survives the impact. Um, you saw Sergeant Anderson do push-ups on it. Um, we brought it to a martial arts studio and and broken a, a board with it. Uh, most recently, we actually put it in a dryer for about ten minutes, and it just tumbled around, and the hand was totally fine. Uh, unfortunately, I can't say the same thing for the dryer, but the hand definitely won that fight. Uh, and it's. Um, it's water resistant up to the wrist. Um, so if it gets dirty, we literally just take it to the sink and then um, we can just uh, rinse it off. And it's uh, also USB-C rechargeable. So the same way you plug in your phone, you can plug in your arm. And if the batteries are dead, it'll recharge within an hour. And if, uh, if your phone is dead, you can actually charge your phone from your arm. So another superhuman ability that we like to give our dryers, or, sorry, sorry, that we like to give our users. Um, sorry, I just saw the word dryer in the chat and it, and, uh, it threw me off. And so um, one of the coolest things about this though, is that uh, it's the first hand on the market to give users touch feedback. And so when Sergeant Anderson holds his daughter's hand, he can actually feel, um, feel it coming from the sensors that are on the index finger, the pinky, and then the thumb. And, uh, and so that's super critical, especially if you want to do manipulation of like delicate objects and, and be able to um, feel from it. And so we've got a vibration motor that's in the socket. And then when you touch on these fingers, you'll actually feel a vibration um, coming through uh, the socket itself. And the best part about this whole thing is that we've actually hit a price point that Medicare will actually cover. And so before the ability hand, the hands like this would only be covered by either um, the VA or workers' compensation. So that only accounted for about 10% of the market that could afford a bionic hand. And so now that we've got it covered under Medicare, we've expanded that to about 75% of people with upper limb amputations can now afford um, a, an, an ability hand. 
And that was huge for us because we wanna make sure that everyone has access to the best, uh, best available devices. So I'm going to share my screen again so you guys can um, see. And let's... And so this is the ability hand that I just showed you guys, and it is actually an FDA registered medical device. So um, it is um, uh, being, uh, we can cover it under insurance because it is FDA registered. Um, and so just to highlight the speed that I was telling you about, um, this next video shows one of our patients up in Chicago, who is a uh, Paralympic triathlete. And three minutes after wearing the hand for the first time, he was able to um, catch a bottle that was thrown to him. Ready? That's it, right here. Oh! And that's because of the speed uh, of the hand itself. And so, uh, and we were talking about how robust these fingers are. And so this next video you'll see on the right side is um, a conventional finger um, that, that is uh, made typically with a, with a pin joint in the, in the knuckle. And then on the left side is our flexible joint that we've developed. Um, and you, we just have like a piston just dropping like a huge weight on the finger. And on the right side, the finger breaks. And on the left side, our hand recovers totally fine. And the finger just returns to its original position. Okay, and so Remember that giant mess of a breadboard that I was uh, that, that you guys saw in that um, er, early uh, video in Ecuador? We reduced that to about the size of half of a credit card. And something else fun that we realized too is that um, the the sensors that we use to uh, measure the muscle activity, we th they would cost about like twenty dollars a piece. And we found out that we could actually get hardware store rivets made of stainless steel that were 20 cents a piece and they worked just as well as these $20 electrodes. And these are the plots showing the muscle signals that we were actually getting from these 20 cent stainless steel rivets. Um, so in 2016, um, we went back down to Ecuador and this time we hooked one up um, to, uh, we hooked his hand up to the socket um, and he was able to, uh, this video is showing him uh, controlling it for the first time. And we were pretty excited that it was able to work. And so we went back again in 2017 and this time um, we, uh, Juan was able to take the hand outside of the lab and into the real world. Like the inevitability of it, we can just feel it in our bones. You know, every day we get up and there's just another development. And it's because it is right now, like this is the nexus of change where prosthetics of tomorrow are going to change thousands and thousands of people's lives. Finally. So then we went back again in 2018, and this was interesting because we went down with two versions of the hand, one that was skin tone matching uh, for Juan, and then another one that was uh, the bionic black look that, that you saw in the demo that I gave. And interestingly, he actually preferred the bionic black look. And what we realized was that it's because it completely changes the narrative for him. If you try to make the hand look as real as possible, then it comes off as more creepy and people can tell. And the default reaction of people is actually one of pity. So it's like, oh, I'm sorry you lost your hand. But when they wear a bionic looking hand, it completely changes the narrative for them. And instead of someone approaching them with pity, it's more like, oh my goodness, you have a bionic hand. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. What's, show me your superhuman abilities. And I mean, Juan told us specifically that he feels like Robocop whenever he's wearing it. So this next video shows like one of the first times he was um, controlling it. You can see the speed with which he's able to control his grip. And this was with the skin tone version of the hand while he's using a broom to sweep the floor. And you can see how quickly and easily he's able to adjust his grip. But when we went down on that trip, of course, the first thing that he wanted to do 
was to drive his car. And the thing is, is that his car isn't a normal car. It is, uh, it's manual transmission. So first of all, his intact right hand had to stay on the stick and his bionic hand had to stay on the wheel. And on top of that, his steering wheel did not have power steering. So he had to maintain a really firm grip on this thing. And so while we were filming this, my heart was racing the entire time because we were in downtown Quito in the middle of like traffic as he's like weaving in and out, like using our bionic hand to, to control the wheel. And luckily we had no problems at all with him driving. And so this next video is showing him driving. And he's even able to do things like change the blinkers. <laughs> and he's able to get back into traffic like it was nothing at all. And so what we focused on there was all, all, all the control of how we're able to control this hand, but we haven't touched on yet as well, touch. And so the way we do this is, um, well, the way we did this was through barometric pressure sensors. They're in all of your guys' cell phones and GPS devices. Um, and they cost like a couple of bucks. Typically they measure air pressure and we modify them. So we inject them with silicone. You can detect um, the change in the silicone. We've actually upgraded these in the last month or so um, to an even more sensitive um, uh, material called like a force sensitive resistor. And so now the pressure sensing is even better. Um, but these sensors can detect super light touches and then super strong touches um, as well. And then we can relay that to the user in different ways. Currently in the commercial version of the, the hand, we have a vibration motor that's similar to your, um, to your cell phone vibrating. Um, but one of the things that we're actively researching is um, electrical stimulation on your skin. So by sending a small amount of current and like changing the timing of it, the amount of current, the, the patterns of it, we can make it feel like different things like light touch, strong touch, pressure, vibration, and even pain. Um, the hard part is, is making it feel consistently like that sensation over a long period of time. And so we're actively researching how we can always consistently make it feel um, like a pressure. Um, but this next video is going to show the first time that we ever hooked up Juan to our sensory feedback system. No, you still don't want to. How about the next and so I'm going to tap on it rapidly. Do you feel all the different tap sensors in right now? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to do this. Can you, can you close your eyes for me? I want you to tell me when I'm actually touching the, your fingers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now what I want you to try to tell me is whether it's a light touch or a strong touch. Light. And keep in mind, again, this was the very first time he was ever doing this, and he was able to detect every single tap I was making and whether it was light or strong. Another thing I want to point out is that you might have noticed that um, my wife is actually in the, the background of that shot um, with our three-month-old son. And I just want to point out that none of this would be possible without her incredible support um, because. The entrepreneur life, like, I mean, it consumes, um, it, it consumes you, right? So to have a support system like that is invaluable in order to make this successful. And it would not be successful without her um, at all. And okay, so with this touch feedback, what does this allow you to do? It allows you to do really fine manipulation of delicate objects. And so this next video, we've got one of our patients up in Chicago. He's an 85 year old triple amputee who um, was able to grasp a hollow eggshell on his first try without cracking it while blindfolded.
And it's all because of the sensory feedback and the, the pressure sensors that are in the fingertips uh, of the ability hand. And, and like I mentioned, this is the first hand on the market to give users um, that sensation. Um, and so just for fun, we also have um, a video of Garrett doing 360 degrees of wrist rotation because we wanted to make him superhuman. And so a lot of the videos that you saw um, are part of a Legendary Pictures documentary. So Legendary Pictures is the studio that did like Dark Knight and Jurassic World. Um, and the documentary is called Make It Work. They did a 30 minute episode on us um, where the fourth episode called The Launch. And it's available to watch if you have Amazon or Roku um, and it's uh, really available on there. And if you have trouble finding it, just send me a message and I can um, send it to you as well. Um, so with that, um, uh, currently we are preparing for a nationwide launch um, coming soon in the next couple of months. We have a goal that we want um, Jimmy Kimmel to arm wrestle the hand on his show before the end of the year. So fingers crossed that we can uh, make this happen. Um, so with that, I would be happy to take any questions that you guys have. Thank you. So we had some questions in the chat, Adil. Um, okay. Let me go back. Um, one was how many recipients actually are using the ability hand currently? Yeah, so we've got about nine of them out in the field right now. And um, we've limited it specifically to the Midwest. And yes, Garrett has one of them as he's showing on, uh, on his camera right over there. And um, we limited it to the Midwest. So this is like Chicago, St. Louis, Indianapolis area. And we wanted to make sure that, I mean, so Garrett has actually tested out basically every single version of the ability hand over the mm -hmm. last like six years. Uh, broke and, parts that weren't supposed to be broke. <laughs> and he's broken parts that, that weren't supposed to break <laughs> either. And so that feedback has been really invaluable for us uh, in order to make sure that this hand is going to be ready for prime time for this nationwide launch um, coming up in, uh, in a couple of months. So um, that's why we limited it to the Midwest. Yeah. yeah. Another question is, is this viable for those with birth defects or only with those or or only for people who have lost a limb. So the question being, well, do people who have have lost a limb or were not didn't have the limb because of the birth defect, would they have muscle signals to pattern? Yeah, and so um, we've actually had a, uh, several patients who have congenital um, uh, limb differences who are actually able to um, use the hand without any issues. The difference is, is that it's not for them, it's not really thinking about moving their fingers because they don't they never like develop those fingers on those sides to like understand um, what that means, but they still have musculature intact there. So they can use that, those muscles in their residual limb to control the hand, but it just might mean something different for them, but they're still able to use it. Oh, this is a good question. What size is the national market and maybe it's an international market considering what we've seen here and what percent are you expecting to capture um, let's say in the next five years yeah that's a that's a great question and so um the u.s actually makes up money wise the u.s actually makes up about half of the worldwide market um and uh worldwide there's about 10 million people with uh with uh, uh upper limb differences um, all together. And so we also have plans for making an ability leg, um, you know, fingers, uh, elbows, and wrists over the next five years too. And so the very least we intend to capture at least 20% of this market um, over the next uh, couple of years. And I think um, the, uh, the estimates are saying that um, prosthetics and orthotics are going to be a $20 billion market in the next uh, couple of years too, like worldwide. So um, that's our goal. Um, so we'll, uh, we're going to aim for it for sure. And, you know, build a, a revolution in uh, bionic futures for people. So one question, you've referred to your national launch several times. Uh, what does that mean for you all and how can we as a community support it? Uh, so uh, what it means for us is that instead of uh, the ability hand just being limited to Chicago, St. Louis, Indianapolis area, any clinician around the entire United States um, will be able to purchase an ability hand for their patients. And so there's over a thousand clinics, uh, prosthetics and orthotics clinics across the entire US. Um, the main one being um, Hanger Clinic, uh, which we have one in, in Champaign um, as well, actually in Urbana now um, as well. 
And um, we are, are currently working with them to get a clinical trial done um, to have it available in all of their places. But more importantly, as well, as we gear up toward this, um, uh, this nationwide launch, we plan to release a series of viral videos uh, of the hand doing like crazy things. So um, for example, uh, I mentioned one of them is doing like an arm wrestling competition um, with it. Uh, another one would be um, uh, bringing it to a martial arts studio, breaking a board with it. Um, we could have um, Garrett do like a boot camp or something like that uh, uh, with the hand as well, right? And so these showing off these, these things that you can do with the hand that you couldn't do with any other bionic hand really because of the, the, um, the robustness that we placed in it. And so in order to make these things go viral, we need everyone to like share it as much as possible and share it with people they know and, and all of their networks. And that would be really critical for us to spread the word um, and, and get this out to as many people as possible. Great. As Kathy mentioned, um, if anybody wants to hop off mute and ask a question, they're more than likely to, or they're more than welcome to. Um, we do have just a few minutes left uh, with a deal. I see the, the hand is back. So. I see Greg's question there and interested me too. It says, um, somehow, are you gonna be able to add temperature um, sensors? So interestingly, um, the, the barometric pressure sensors that are in here are actually temperature sensors as well. Uh, but the harder part is relaying that information to the user. So um, it's, you can, you can heat the skin pretty rapidly, but it's also highly energy inefficient. So it drain your batteries pretty quickly. Uh, but even harder than that is cooling the skin um, really rapidly. There's these things called Peltier elements or Peltier elements that you could use to um, uh, cool the skin, but it's not on a rapid uh, time scale. So it, it could take like a couple seconds, but if you're like touching a block of ice, you want to know like, immediately that it's, um, that it's cold. Um, there's uh, researchers, I think, in Japan who are actively working on that. And so we're, we're, um, we've found that pressure is the most important signal first. So we want to get that down first before we move into some of these other um, uh, sensing uh, modalities as well. Right. I guess the one I just thought of too was how long does uh, the hand run on like a charge? Yeah. And so uh, we've got to, and it depends on like how much you're using. Cause if you're like, you know, opening and closing it like rapidly, then it's not going to, it's probably only going to last like a couple hours, but on a typical daily basis, usually around like eight hours or so. And then okay. you can, yeah, the idea is that you recharge it overnight. Um, but also because it's USB-C, you can have a portable uh, power pack with you that you can use to charge the battery. So if you're out like camping and you can't like access the plug, then you can use one of those to recharge your hand as well. Well, we have some new battery technologies coming into the incubator, so maybe uh, some uh, uh, natrium. That's right. Partnerships in your in your future. So that's um, right. But uh, any any advice that you have for folks who've been in your shoes, who may have had a been in graduate school, had an idea, and wanted to move it forward? What would you say? What what, what advice would you give yourself yeah. five or six years ago? Yeah. Um, it, it takes a lot of perseverance, um, a lot of perseverance to get through this. And so to put things in perspective, right, um, in the, the, the summer of 2017, um, me, my senior robotics engineer, Jesse Kornman, uh, my six month pregnant wife, my one and a half year old son, and three of our employees were in China for two and a half months where we were like trying to figure out our motor manufacturers and our gear manufacturers while we were out there. And while we were out there, we also tried to do an Indiegogo campaign to raise funds so that we could then turn this into something that would be like, like viable, right? And so we had a goal of like raising $150,000 uh, from this Indiegogo campaign. And we only ended up getting 6,000. So like completely, completely like not even close to uh, the goal that we were trying to get to. And at the, at the end of that year, we only had about $200 left in our bank account. And so it was kind of like a make or break moment for the company. And we had applied for our first uh, SBIR grant that summer. And we were fortunate enough that in December of that year, we had gotten it. So on December 31st, we had $200 in our bank account. And January 1st, it was like $200,000, $200 in our bank account. And it was just like a night and day difference. And we never had like that kind of money ever working with we were like always working with like you know five hundred dollars a semester before then right and now we could actually uh like afford to pay ourselves 
a salary to live on and transition full time um, to the company. So, um, and like, you know, things like that keep happening, right? Where these, these like extremely low lows followed by these like extremely high highs. And it's like, you need a support system to do that. Enterprise Works has been a great ecosystem to help support us in order to make it through those kind of times. And I'm, I'm really excited to that we finally come to this point where we're, we're close to a nationwide launch. Well, as, as you all know, we have other, we have SDIR resources to help others get that funding and hopefully put that to the hundred, uh, uptick their bank accounts from that 200 and 200,000. But thank you for that shout out. We appreciate it. We love working with you and your team um, and watching this success move forward and can't wait to celebrate this nationwide launch. So thank you so much, Adil. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, and as mentioned, we will have a, a link to the recording out as soon as we can, and we'll send out the slides to the registrants of today's program. So thank you so much, Adil. Uh, you've been a pleasure, and we just we're looking forward to seeing what happens from here. Thanks, Laura, and thanks everyone for attending.